Pastor Marty thought this would be a good time for me to make an announcement. So here I am. I'm uh, in the fellowship hall with Pris after the service, where the people that are delving out these delicious confections called boomerangs. And if you've never had one, oh my, <laughs> they're delicious. They really are. We are selling, almost selling out. Um, we sold 56 dozen at the bazaar, unheard of before. And orders are just flying out the door. Uh, so we have two more work sessions and that's it. And the deadline for orders is the 5th of December. If you want to order or take some today, we'll be available. There's 750 a dozen. Thank you. Thank you, Daddy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. I apologize. I must be still on central time <laughs> or something. Um, so welcome to this service for the first Sunday of Advent. Happy New Year. We're starting a new year in the Christian year. So we just closed off the Gospel of Mark and into the Gospel of Luke, year C in the lectionary. Although we won't be reading any Luke today, this series is from Marsha McPhee, who is a wonderful worship designer. We usually use her series for Advent and for Lent. This series is called um, The Inn. So here we are in Bethlehem, aren't we? Housing the Holy. So it's all about making room, making space in our lives. Don't we all need to do that? I know I do. Life gets so cluttered with, not just with things, but with anxieties and concerns. So um, just a couple of announcements as we get started, besides the boomerangs. This afternoon, looks like the snow is ending a little, I hope. Uh, we are having an important and fun event called the Advent Fair. Many, some of you may remember it from years ago. You kind of resurrected it, three o'clock till around five. Anyone can come. It's for all ages, and it'll be uh, kind of crafty. But even if you're not a crafty person, uh, it'll be very hands-on with uh, hopefully lots of little children making some candles, and uh, we'll need adults to help with that and um, get us into the spirit of the season. And um, for this season, because we have so many beautiful decorations, uh, thank you for all those who made, made that happen this week. Uh, we're not using the screen in services. Uh, the folks online can still see the PowerPoint, but we're gonna rely on good old fashioned bulletins and hymnals and Bibles. So they're all in your pew if you're here in the bullet in the, uh, and I hope you also picked up a little communion cup. Uh, filled with grape juice. If you didn't get one yet, there's some in the front, there's some in the back, there's also a gluten-free option. And that's just during this COVID time, we're wanting to make sure we're especially uh, protected. So that's why we're using those. Um, I also will be going next Sunday. I'm going out to Colorado to officiate at my Aunt Johanna's funeral uh, in Boulder, Colorado at the United Methodist Home. Um, Trina Halstead will be preaching. She's a lay speaker from Mount Vision. I know you'll really enjoy her. She's wonderful. She also works for Healthy Families here in town. Some of you may know that agency. Um, you, there's prayer cards in the pew. What else should I say? We're a reconciling congregation, uh, open to all. And up in the booth, we have Randy and Willa, and John's going to be doing chimes and uh, piano and organ for us. And I'm Reverend Marty Swartz Harrell. So let's begin with a word of silent prayer, just a time to collect ourselves and breathe in the calm and peace of this season.
The pandemic has laid bare and widened economic disparity locally and globally. As we enter the Advent season, how can our church become a house where the holy will be born anew, offering respite, sustenance, and care, opening the doors ever wider to those seeking shelter from the onslaught of life? No one church can do it all, but each can do something. As we study the biblical prophets that call us to care for our neighbors and to make room in the end, the lonely and frightened spaces within us are filled with the light of hope, peace, joy, and love. Today we offer the light of hope to illumine the door of welcome. May this light shine in our hearts, in our lives, and in our church. May hope awaken us to possibilities and lead to greater hospitality. There is room in this inn, a house for the holy. to light our first Advent candle. Thank you, Alan, for helping out with that. Don't hang on that. Just push, squeeze it, just squeeze it. No, squeeze, there you go. Oh. There you go. Thanks. That's all. So as we rise to sing our first hymn, we just ask you all to turn around and wave a wave of hope and peace. Please don't hang on that ring. It's going to fall right off. Um, especially wave to the folks who are worshiping at home. That'll be great. Thank you. And our opening hymn is number 203 in the red hymnal. Uh, Hail to the Lord's anointed. Thank you.
So children, come on up. Who's here? Do we have any? I think they're coming from downstairs. Woo! How exciting. Yay. Come on in, Ruthie. Yeah, come on. We need your help with this big, big box. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Come on in. Have a seat. Come right. Come right in here. Have a seat on the first pew next to this beautiful bow. Yeah. So, yeah. Oof. Yeah, have a seat right here. So what do you notice? What's different in here? Is there anything different, Ruth, from last time when you came here last time? What's different? What are some new things? Ooh. Christmas trees. Wow. Beautiful. And what do you see up here? Is that lovely? You see some animals and they're in the stable, aren't they? Munching on some hay, munch, munch, munch. And you have some beautiful stars across the hills of Bethlehem. We're going to sing a song about Bethlehem a little before. That's the little village where Jesus was born. What else do you notice? What else is new, 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 new? Beautiful. So many things. What else? For this new season of Advent. Right? Yeah, that's great. Well, how about this? Do you have your tree up at home yet? You do? Wow, we don't yet. But do you have any presents under the tree? Not yet. Not yet? Okay, well, it's not, we're not supposed to open presents before Christmas, are we? No. But this one we can at least peek in. What do you think is in here? This is a big, big present. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a pony. Oh! <gasps> Or a puppy. You think it'd be a puppy? I don't hear anything. Ruthie, come up and I'll, I'll see if you can. I'm not going to unwrap the whole thing, but see if you can peek in here and see what's inside. You see any? Nothing, right? It's not, there's nothing in there. <laughs> but it's full of possibilities. It's full of. I know you'd be good at making this into something else, right? What, do, what would you do if you had a big, big box like this at home? Would you make it into something? Maybe a house. You could open this hole up here and make it into something. You could crawl in and out. You could hide from your little brother. You could make it into a tower or a fort. We went to a big, long thing called Fortlandia in Austin, Texas, where they had a long series of forts. I think we walked five miles that day and climbed on all these forts. So you could make this into a fort, right? Wouldn't that be fun? And the only thing you need to make all those things is imagination. And I know you have a lot of that. And hope, right? You can't have hope without imagination because hope and imagination go together. So when we're hopeful, it's because we can imagine, just not a stupid old box, we can imagine in making it into something like a present or a fort or whatever you wanna make it into, right? Wouldn't that be fun? So that's what we're talking about today is, is hope and imagination. So I think John's got some chimes for us. Would you like to sing our new song for Advent? That will be so fun. Yeah, this is a song that John wrote many years ago. You could write some songs sometime, I bet. Yeah. Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. I have to go grab my other Okay, so, like, 
asked, she said, this is a song I wrote actually for my, uh, the cantata that my co-director at the time and I wrote. So it's one large work and it has been, uh, I think it's been recorded because I also orchestrated it. All right, who has read? Red. Red? Good. So red again. Blue. The first reading is Jeremiah 33, verses 14 to 16. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill my gracious promise with the people of Israel and Judah. In those days, and at that time, I will raise up a righteous branch from David's line, who will do what is just <clears throat> and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is what he will be called, the Lord of our righteousness.
The second reading is Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach it to me. Because you are the God who saves me. I put my hope in you all day long. Thank you, Alan. Man, that song always makes me cry. Just says it all. Hmm. Today on this first Sunday in Advent, we are opening the doors to hope, as the innkeeper did for Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem so long ago. Let's remember they were a young couple directed, ordered, commanded to travel to the city of their family's lineage by a government decree. Ordered to travel by an oppressive regime, an occupying force, Mary, big with child. But there was no room in the inn that night. The innkeeper nevertheless opened the door of the stable. How could he have known? He was opening the door to the hope of the world, Emmanuel. Today we are opening the doors to hope. To be human is to hope, to hope against hope, even when all seems lost. Hope is the thing with feathers, poet Emily Dickinson wrote. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Hope never stops. Hope springs eternal. As the psalmist confesses to God, I put my hope in you all the day long. Robert Fredrickson writes, hope comes into its own when crisis looms, opening to us new creative possibilities. With great need comes an unusually wide range of ideas, as well as yearnings, yearnings for happiness, courage, and empowerment, end quote. That was certainly the case, was it not, with the prophet I, uh, Jeremiah, whose long career speaking truth to power coincided with the great crisis of exile of his people Israel to Babylon. The words we heard Alan read from chapter 33, part of what's called the Book of Consolation, came to Jeremiah while he was under house arrest by the Imperial Guard. Even so imprisoned, Jeremiah never lost hope. He proclaimed that God's promises are trustworthy and true. He predicted that God would respond creatively to the people's crisis, causing a new branch to spring out of the stock of David, a new ruler who would do what is just and right in the land. And his name shall be called, the Lord is our righteousness. And the early church saw in those hopeful words, a prophecy of the coming, the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Last Sunday when we were in Austin, Texas on our Thanksgiving trip, some of my sister's friends threw her a birthday party with people sitting at various tables around the yard. Yes, you can have a backyard party in Texas in November. That's a great way to gather with a large crowd during COVID. And my sister introduced Dana and me to a woman she works with at the University of Texas. Tanya Voss had a field ed at the social work school. As well as to Tanya's wife, we fell into a long and fascinating conversation about, of all things, the future of the United Methodist Church. Tanya and her wife are members of University United Methodist in Austin, which is a reconciling congregation. She was dumbfounded to hear that we have been reconciling since 1989. She 
didn't even know that was a thing in the 80s. Tanya grew up in a very conservative town in rural East Texas. She knew she was lesbian since she was quite young. Her parents disowned her when she came out to them as a teenager. But the United Methodist Church youth group opened their arms to her and loved her just as she was. Amen. That's what we're talking about this Advent, opening the door to hope. Opening that door can be a matter of life and death, choosing to make room for flourishing and loving and growing rather than allowing people to shrink back from fear and rejection. We're opening the door to hope this Advent and every season, continuing to live into our vocation as a reconciling congregation to be a safe haven for people in crisis, strengthen our commitment to our mission to be a congregation of faith and doubt, standing in solidarity with all who are marginalized and oppressed as Jesus did. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the song without the words and never stops at all. This weekend, many of us have been singing along with tunes from the musicals that Stephen Sondheim wrote. The great composer, playwright, and lyricist died on Friday at the age of 91. It's amazing that Sondheim grew up to be such a creative after the childhood he endured. He said later he never really had parents, although he did leave a husband. Jeff Rowley married rather late in life. Sondheim's father left the family when Stephen was 10 years old, left him with a mother who alternately abused and teased him. When you think about the musicals he collaborated on, many of them are about people seeking family, which everybody needs. Everyone needs a family, amen? People seeking family, of which he had little personal experience, but plainly yearned for. Think about you know, how the Jets and the Sharks both kind of function as family in the West Side Story and company and into the woods, so many more. As a young boy, Sondheim was mentored by no less a shining star than Oscar Hammerstein II, a friend of his parents who took him under his wing, became a strong parental figure for him, as well as mentoring him in the ways of writing for the musical theater. Sondheim wrote his first musical when he was a teenager. He showed it to Hammerstein, who said, who told him it was the worst thing he had ever read, but that he would help him if he wanted to learn. So the great master worked with the young writer and gave him some writing exercises, opened the door to hope in his life. In the end, Sondheim turned all of Hammerstein's training on its head to invent an entirely new tradition of American musical theater, a tradition that's not just about entertainment, but speaks to the burning issues of the world in which we live. How will we make room this Advent, clear a space, open the door to hope in some young person, some old person, some whatever age person's life, in a family's life, in a, in a whole community's life, in a nation's life? This week, my husband and I read a lot of books to our granddaughters and grandnieces and nephews. And one of my favorite books to read is for, to them is The Little Engine That Could by Waddy Piper. It's a classic about the little blue engine, I'm sure you know it, who comes along at just the right moment to help a broken down train pull its load of toys and books and good food over the mountain. Hope is that little engine within us that refuses to give up that says over and over, say it with me. I think I can, 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 I think I can. Hope is a habit we can cultivate. Hope is a cognitive skill that brings more good into the world. It is as we think we can open these old doors to hope, that we find we are doing just that. So as we break the bread and drink the cup of Christ's sacrifice today around our Advent table of hope, we are clearing space. We are making room 
in our hearts, in our lives, for the birth of the Christ child. Amen. moment we open the doors of our hearts to honesty before God about what we've done and left undone that created less hope in a hurting world. So let us breathe out any regrets and breathe in the life-giving, forgiving spirit of God. out again with the peace of Christ. Make of my life a moment we open the doors of our lives to the call of the spirit inviting us to become more than we can ask or imagine let us breathe out our fear and breathe in the courage of the spirit of god and out again with the peace of christ and the doors of this church, filling it with the compassion of Christ for all those who are struggling. We remember and pray for all those who are on our prayer list, especially for the family of Evelyn Schaefer, a member who died at age 97 on Thanksgiving Day. Her service at the graveside at Glenwood will be private for the family on Tuesday to lift up the Schaefer family and all those on our prayer list. We pray for those who are suffering economic hardship and insecurity in basic needs. May abundance be shared. We pray for those who are suffering mentally, finding it difficult to cope. May paths open and hope return. We pray for those who are suffering illness or injury. May healing abound. We pray for those who are suffering loneliness and isolation. May companionship and solace arrive. We pray for those who are suffering discrimination, fear, and violence. May they know respect, respite, and safety. May the advent of compassion be born in us, reside within us, move outward from us to meet the needs of the world, making a house for the holy that is each and every child of God. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, our creator, redeemer, sustainer, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, we lift up our offerings. The, today and the last Sunday of November is still the jingle for uh, the Warming Center down the street here, just a little past, um, uh, yeah, a little before next. It's on the other side of the street, though. And for all the gifts that have been sent in from various directions um, by mail or by PayPal, um, the Tithely app, many other ways. The Bible doesn't actually mention an innkeeper in the story of Jesus' birth, but this popular notion is alive in our imagination. Sometimes the innkeeper gets a bad rap as if provide, providing substandard accommodations for a family about to go through the birthing process. But what if we saw the innkeeper as someone who, with a full house, thought literally outside the box to solve a problem? What if we endeavored to do the same to provide ministry to house the holy in ways we have not yet imagined? Let us pray that in this Advent season, we will invite ministries that stir our imagination, that these gifts will be used for those. Lord, make it happen as we know only you can do. Bless these gifts and bless our imagination to think outside the boxes of ministries and to create a space for hope. Amen. Now we will move into a time of Holy Communion. Um, I hope you all, as I said before, have anybody not have a little communion kit? So I think, I think we're all set. And we also have gluten-free ones. Um, The Lord be with you. right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you almighty god creator of heaven and earth you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life when we turned away and our love failed your love remained steadfast you delivered us from captivity made covenants be our sovereign god and spoke to us through your prophets and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn Jesus Christ, your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and who announced the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread. After having given thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to all his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. 
Also, after supper, he took the cup. Again, giving God thanks and praise, he gave the cup to all his disciples, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This is the new cup of new covenant poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in memory of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen. Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. So Christ comes in final victory, and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. gifts of God for the people of God. In the United Methodist Church, we practice an open table, which means every person here is welcome to partake in the Lord's Supper. So you have this little, very self-contained little kit, and you'll peel off the very top layer of, then you'll get at the uh, little wafer there, and go ahead and eat that. The body of Christ is broken for you. And then after you've gotten that, you may open the next layer, which will bring you to the grape juice. This is the cup of salvation offered for you. Go ahead and drink, all of you. Lord, we thank you for feeding us with this holy meal. May it strengthen and nourish us for the ministry that you give us, opening a door to hope here in this community. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And we will have a little bin for the empties close by. Each week in this series, we'll close our, out with a Christmas carol. Yes, Advent is not yet the birth of Christ. However, as we prepare our homes and this house for the holy, we live in the already and the not yet. We already know the rest of the story, and yet we have not seen the fulfillment of a time when suffering ends. Today, we sing A Little Town of Bethlehem, a carol written by Phillips Brooks in 1865 after a horseback ride between Jerusalem and Bethlehem on Christmas Eve. An original verse not included in our hymnals is especially poignant for our theme this season. It goes like this. Where children pure and happy pray to the blessed child, where misery cries out to thee, son of the mother mild, where charity stands watching and faith holds wide the door. This dark night wakes, the glory breaks, and Christmas comes once more. Let us remember that it was in a little and unassuming town where the holy was housed. We too can offer light and hope and a place where faith holds wide the door, even and especially in our little town. So you can find your hymn 20, 230, 230 in the red hymnal. And please stand if you are able.
May God's door of welcome swing open in your heart and in your life. May Christ's humble first dwelling remind you of the plenty you already know. And may the spirit lead you into more possibility and hospitality than you can imagine, making room in the inn for all. May it be so for you. May it be so for us. May it be so for this church and for this community. Amen. Thank you.